Hello. Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. So we have um, like these little cubes in the basement that have stuffed bears in them. And the other day I'm walking past and I out of the corner of my eye see eyeballs following me shut up was there a cat in there yeah oh god i fucking hate those bears frankenstein got inside one of the cubes and was just like watching me walk by scared the bejeebies out of me yeah that'd do it but i'm really glad it was him and not like the bears or the dolls that's a (laughs) great point because that would have been so bad we would have had to burn the whole house down. i was gonna say i wouldn't be recording this right the now because i would be house. like three states over goodbye <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um today's story is uh one of those that like i heard about a long time ago and it has just never left my brain okay So well, you've dropped a couple of those on me lately. So yeah, it's like oh god, it's such a haunting story. And um, once it popped in my head, I was like, oh my god, I I have to know everything about it immediately. Okay, wait, is it haunting? Like ooh, or like haunting? Like ooh, ooh. Okay, well, (laughs) all right, all right. The story we're covering today has been the inspiration for several true crime dramatizations. It was adapted in episodes of CSI, Fargo, and Law and & Order, and served as the basis for the 2007 film Stuck, 2009's Hit and & Run, and 2009's Accident on Hill Road. Jeez. Mm-hmm. This also inspired a scene from a Fox show that Hannah and I watch called... 911. What? In season three, a woman hits a homeless man after crashing into him with her car. The man was lodged in the windshield of her car, and then the woman drove around town for nearly two days before somebody stopped her. You know what? It's well, okay, that was going to be a really bad choice of wording because I was going to start that with it's funny, but it's that's not, not what I meant. <laughs> I get it. I, but I was going to say that what is funny is mm-hmm. the fact that I was about to say season three, I'm not going to fucking remember that. Yeah. And then as soon as you started talking about it, I was like, oh, wait. Yeah. This you know, is buried in there. I sure do yeah. remember that. Absolutely. The case was covered in a film called Midnighters, which was written by Alston Ramsey, who said, quote, I was inspired to write this film after reading about the case in the newspaper. You just wonder how this could have happened. This was a woman who was trained to help people, and she didn't respond to someone who was begging for help in her own garage. On October 25th, 2001, around 11 p.m., 25-year-old Shantae Jawan Mallard went out for a night of fun at a friend's apartment. She had a few drinks, smoked pot, and took ecstasy before heading out to a nightclub called Joe's Big Bamboo Club. Um, And when she got there, she continued to drink with her friends. That's a combination. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. No judgment, because, like, you know, you do you. But that is a a mixture of things. It sure is. So, you know, they're there getting their groove on. And Shantae left the club around 2.30 a.m. with her friend. groove on. (laughs) (laughs) My brain could not hear anything you said after that because it was just cycling in my head. (laughs) Oh, yep. man. All right. Let's try this again. Shaking their groove thing. Oh, boy. All right. I'm okay. so hip and cool okay, with the lingo. Megan, stop talking. <laughs> stop fucking talking. Um, oh, no. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Uh, around 2.30 a.m., her and her friend Tita Lise who also goes by T Fry, so we're going to call her T because that's so much easier. Yep. (laughs) Um, They left. 
Shantae attempted to drive, but her friend could tell that she was, like, way too intoxicated. So T ended up driving. After they drove to T's home, Shantae got into her vehicle around 3 a.m. and she was heading home, but accidentally hit a homeless man. And that was 37-year-old Gregory Glenn Biggs. The accident took place on a six-lane highway about five miles southeast of downtown Fort Worth. The force of the crash sent him over the hood and into her windshield, where he got lodged inside. Oh, my God. And that was halfway through the glass, and he was critically injured. Shantae chose not to call the police seek help, or even provide medical aid to the man, even though she was a nurse's aide. Instead, she drove home, which was about a mile away, so she was able to drive a mile with this man lodged in her windshield. I can't even drive when there's, like, a huge-ass bug splatted in front of my, like, in front of my view. I can't handle it. How do you drive with a whole-ass person in your window? Right, or even, okay, so, like, you know... We've all in Minnesota done it where you uh, have too much ice and snow on top of your windshield when you're going to drive somewhere and it's like incredibly dumb, but we all have because you're in a huge hurry and so you like think that you can get there by you cannot your little teeny uh, window that you scrape. (laughs) You get to the end of your road and you're like, I cannot see, I don't know if there's a car next to me or not. So then you have to get out and waste more time scraping it all off. So that's why it's like a whole human being. Is in her windshield, and somehow she got her vehicle mm-hmm. home. Just honestly impressive. I I guess, yeah, that she was even able to make that happen. So she gets home, she parks in the garage, and she left Gregory in her windshield, bleeding and whimpering for help. Shantae says that she checked on him several times, and she apologized to him, but she didn't do anything to help. And he, okay. yeah. what the fuck? Right. Exactly. Oh, I checked on him. Right. I came out and looked a few times and like said sorry. I, yeah. So he ended up dying several hours later. Several hours later. That's awful. Yes. There was a lot of time here to change the course of things. The friend that Shantae was out partying with testified that Shantae called her. Around 3.30 a.m. and whispered, T, come pick me up. When she arrived at her home, Shantae came running out, jumped into her car, and started screaming for her to drive. The two of them went to track down Terrence at his apartment and at his sister's house, but they couldn't find him. So they're running all around town looking for somebody else. Then they headed back to Shantae's home, and that's where she told T that she had hit a white guy and she was sorry and didn't mean to do it. Okay, so basically it was like giving enough time for him to die almost. Right, yeah. Like them being out, you know what I mean? And it's like, I have no idea what T is thinking, so she's driving her friend around who's in hysterics, and she's like... Okay, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. So she explains that she tried to get him off of her car near the Martin Village Creek area, but he was too heavy. She admitted that the man was still alive when she drove into the garage, and she knew this because she could hear him moaning. When they got back to the house, T went into the garage and saw the back side of Gregory's body sticking out of the windshield, and she told Shantae, she's like, girl, you need to call 911. I can't even imagine being that friend and walking in and being like, what? This is like Yeah, like, real? cannot compute. What? This is ridiculous. <laughs> but Shantae did not call 911. They both ended up leaving the home so they could go sleep at T's house instead. Because she didn't want to be in this situation. Uh, It just gets more frustrating as time goes on here. It's already mind-blowing. Yes. The next morning, Shantae borrowed T's car and cell phone, and she attempted to locate her ex-boyfriend, Cleet Daniil Jackson. 
So he wakes up to more than 20 voicemails from her. And she met up with him at his grandmother's house. And the two of them then drove back to Shantae's house. On the way, she said she messed up real bad and she was frantic. She told him that she had been in a car accident, but she did not mention that there was a body lodged in the windshield. Yeah, I mean, that'd be pretty good uh, information to know. You would think so, because he has no idea. So he's like, oh my God, why is she freaking out? It's a car accident. You know what I mean? And so he gets there. He attempts to enter the garage, and Shantae starts screaming and says, I hit somebody. He's still in the car. Oh, my God. And so Cleet is like, (sighs) okay. He goes in, he sees what's going on, and he touched Gregory's body with a rake to see if he was still alive, but he was not moving. Cleet later testified, quote, if I could have given him blood, I would have. He was already deceased. None of us stopped to think, what if? We were scared. We panicked. He had recently been released from prison, so Cleet feared that he was going to get in trouble again if he went to the police instead of helping Shantae to get rid of the body. Yeah, that was so nice of her to call and involve all these people instead of just calling fucking 911. Right. Yep. Exactly. And so he said, quote, I finally got my life back to be the father to my kids. I knew she got me in trouble. He explained that he helped her because, quote, if she shot somebody and called me, I knew it would be on purpose. If she stabbed somebody and called me, I knew it would be on purpose. You don't hit nobody on purpose. She panicked. I knew it was an accident. He testified that Shantae said she had unsuccessfully tried to remove Gregory from the windshield immediately after hitting him and even broke the glass with her arm. Okay, but why does that matter? Because she didn't get him help. I know. I agree. She acknowledged knowing he was alive when she pulled into the garage, and Shantae's friend suggested that they should burn Gregory's corpse. Good. That'll fix this problem. Right, because she's like, you know, then he won't be found. Um, But they didn't like this idea. And Cleet told her, quote, We ain't going to burn no body. We're just going to leave him somewhere so they can bury him because it was an accident. He said that he didn't want to bury the body. He wanted to put him in an area where he would be found so that his family could bury him. Cleet and Shantae borrowed a friend's car. So now we're involving Involving somebody else. Involving another person. Mm -hmm. Although this person had no idea. So they borrow this car and Cleet shoveled the body into a blanket, tied the blanket, and put it in the trunk of the car and drove to Cobb Park. Jesus, this is why I don't borrow my car to anybody. Ever. But then he calls his cousin. Oh my God. No, Uh no, 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 no. Okay. So he calls up Herbert Tyrone Cleveland and he shows up and the two men removed the body from the trunk. And laid it on the ground in the Why park. Is everybody is so okay with this. That's what Ugh. is so scary here. Not only the fact that, like, all, all of the things that she did initially to get into this spot here, and then everybody is like, it's yeah, just, I'll help you and, out. And no problem, girl. Nobody's, like, running the hell out of there as soon as they find out and right. calling 911. Imagine that. There's so much time to do this here. After they left the park, they threw the blanket away and they went through a car wash. Gregory's body was discovered on October 27th at Cobb Park in Fort Worth. Two men saw a firefighter, Todd Breedlove, leaving the station and they told him that they thought there was a dead body over in Cobb Park. So the firefighter continued to lock up and it took about a minute to drive to the park. After checking the body and realizing there was no pulse, he called 911. What? Right? How did you oh think my- of that? That's so I insane. Would have never. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's what you're supposed to do. Got it. I guess we'll have to jot that down. Yeah, for sure. I'll forget. 
When the police arrived, they saw that the man's shoes and socks were missing and his injuries made investigators believe that he was a victim of a hit and run. But they quickly realized there was no blood at the scene. So they knew that his body had been moved to the park. An autopsy was performed on the body and the medical examiner, Dr. Nizam Pirwani, concluded that Gregory had died several hours after he was hit. Quote, he couldn't have died instantaneously. There was some interval of time before he died. We're talking hours. The autopsy showed that Gregory's left leg had almost been amputated, which resulted in severe blood loss and then later death. His cause of death was listed as, quote, multiple traumatic injuries sustained in auto-pedestrian collision. And the manner of death was homicide. The medical examiner concluded that Gregory had not been injured near the park because the speeds necessary to inflict his injuries would have been almost impossible in that specific area. It was his opinion that Gregory Biggs had bled to death. The autopsy results were initially classified as pending, but the status changed to could not be determined on January 7th, 2002, when they still couldn't find any information about the victim's death. This was later changed to homicide based on the new information that did come in. So four months went by, and the police had no idea what had happened to Gregory Biggs until a tip came in. Miranda Daniel reported that around Valentine's Day, she had been at a friend's house with six other girls, including Shantae Mallard. They were all talking and drinking, and they were trying to decide who was going to be the driver because they were all planning to go out later that evening. So they're like, yo, somebody's got to stay sober enough here. Miranda told police that Shantae said, she could not drive. When the other ladies asked her why, she giggled and said she hit a man with her car and he had gone through the windshield. Miranda said that Shantae was laughing when she said, quote, I hit this white man. What the fuck? Yeah. Miranda said that, and, and okay, you know what? I want to stop there for a second because, like, that pisses me off so much because Initially, you know, when she drug her ex-boyfriend into this whole thing, he's like, I think it was an accident, which right. obviously she didn't intend to hit this man right. while she was driving. But she had drugs and alcohol in her system, and now she's laughing about it. And it's scary as hell because isn't she like a nurse or something like that? Yes, yeah, she is. Yeah, and that's scary. Yeah. And, like knowing that somebody like that could be taking care of you. Because you're supposed to help others. Yeah. You know, and she did absolutely nothing and now thinks it's funny and is out partying more. So Miranda said that Shantae explained that she was on ecstasy and was drunk at the time of the crash. Shantae also allegedly told her when she returned home after the crash, her boyfriend was in the house and the two of them had sex before she went to the garage to check on Gregory. What? I do not believe this part. Okay. And the reason being, there is never mention, even in some of the court documents that I went through, of a boyfriend being inside the home when this was all taking place. Okay, well, like, thank God, because that... Yeah. So... Yep. I, I don't think that that's true. Okay. Um, I mean... I'm going to hope not. I really... Because it's really repulsive. Don't even have words for... Mm -hmm. I, I hope it's not true. Yep. Yeah. It was mentioned that Shantae allegedly planned to destroy her car and make an insurance claim. Shantae later denied this account, but police obtained a warrant to search her home on February 26th of 2002. There were pieces of evidence found in her home, including the damaged car in her garage with the seats missing, stains on the floorboard of the vehicle, car seats burnt in the backyard, and a pool of blood on the garage floor. Um, yeah. That'll so, do it. Mm-hmm. 
Forensic tests showed blood and hair from the victim still lodged in remnants of the car's windshield. She was initially charged with failing to stop and render aid, but the charge was later changed to murder and tampering with evidence after the results of Gregory's autopsy came out. The two men that helped Shantae dispose of the body were also charged with tampering with evidence. Good. Mm Mm-hmm. Shantae was brought to the police station and agreed to make a statement. During the confession, Shantae said that she only had two drinks at the party, and she believed someone had slipped something into her drink, and she denied having sex with her boyfriend while Gregory was dying in the garage. I'm sorry, slip some, did, did she not take ecstasy at the beginning of this? She sure did. And smoke weed and uh-huh. drink on top of that? Yes, but she is like not okay. taking the blame here. It's somebody else's fault. I got drugged. That's what she's going with. Okay. She told the police that after his body was removed from the windshield, it took several days before she was able to go back to the garage. Once she did... She removed the seats from her car and put them in the backyard and burned one of the seats. 27-year-old Cleet Daniil Jackson pleaded guilty to tampering with or fabricating physical evidence, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. 24-year-old Herbert Tyrone Cleveland was indicted on the same charge. He also pleaded guilty and was sentenced to nine years in prison. Both men agreed to testify against Shantae, so... It looks like that's how they got this deal to bring the charges down. Shantae's attorney, Mike Heiskell, said that his client isn't a monster. She just made a bad decision. Uh, Quote, mm, oh, I know. Okay. (laughs) She was simply a frightened, emotionally distraught young woman who had an accident, panicked, and made a wrong choice, which, please do not downplay something like this. Yo, I get, like... Being in shock. And panicking. And not knowing how you're going to react. hours. This isn't something that took seconds or Considering minutes. Considering hours. she straight said she went and checked on him. Right. She knew what was happening. And she's she got was time aware. to run around town and look for other friends to drag into this whole thing. So. She had so much. She knew exactly what the hell she was doing. Yes. I'm sure she was scared. I don't doubt that for a second. Obviously, she did not mean to hit him in the first place. No. At least I don't think, but... I'm sure she didn't. Obviously, that was not meant to happen, but it did, and... Holy shit, it could have been a lot less of a situation here had she gotten help right away. Yeah. Even, I mean, again, a nurse. Yeah. She could have helped. Mm-hmm. I know that she couldn't get his body, but like she, she couldn't get his body out. But like she could have done things to stabilize him until they got there. That's to exactly help him. it, because like she's trained in that, she knows how to do it. And so like to downplay it and just say like, oh, it was an accident, she made a wrong choice. No, no, there's something a lot worse that happened here, and she's not taking any responsibility. She's pl- you know sitting there going, oh, someone drugged me. No, they did not. You drugged yourself. Yeah. Sure did. Lieutenant David Burgess from the Fort Worth Police Department said that Shantae was charged with murder because she could have prevented Gregory's death. Quote, there's a pretty good possibility he'd be alive if he'd gotten help, but she concealed the body in her garage. I feel like there's a really high probability considering he was alive for hours. Exactly. Yeah. And they said that, like, his wounds, yeah, they were bad. Like, obviously, he bled out, but... It took so long, he probably would have been fine. Like, yeah. maybe he would have lost a leg, you know? But he could have lived. Exactly. Shantae testified that, quote, When I hit him, it was a very loud noise. All this glass started flying in the car, followed by a lot of wind, and the glass was just cutting at my skin, stinging me. She explained that she briefly got out of the car and she tried to touch Gregory, but that's when she panicked and drove home and his leg was protruding from the windshield and she knew he was still alive. She said, quote, I didn't know what to do. I started screaming. I just started yelling. Shantae said, quote, I drove my 1997 Chevrolet Cavalier toward home and that's how I was on Freeway 287. I think when I was coming around the bend from Loop 820 before Village Creek, all of a sudden, bam, 
He was just there. I realized that it was a person I had hit, and he had come through the right front windshield. I was scared and terrified, and the car didn't even slow down. He was on my car and stuck through the right front windshield. I parked my car in the garage, and I put the door down. I wanted to take him to the hospital, but I was too scared. Shantae said Gregory moaned and his nearly severed leg was on the dashboard. She pulled into her garage and lowered the door, then cried and kept apologizing to him. Apologizing is not going to do anything. Absolutely not. The medical examiner, Dr. Nizam Pirwani, testified in court that Shantae's act of continuing to drive the vehicle home after the accident further aggravated Gregory's injuries. Yeah. It's his opinion that leaving him inside the garage without medical help is what caused his death. Prosecution witnesses believe that Gregory probably lived for about two hours. Dr. Nizam Pirwani said Gregory had no, quote, instantaneously fatal injuries. He did not have any spinal cord trauma, no brain trauma, no major cardiac lacerations or lacerations to the aorta or major blood vessels. He had, quote, serious injuries, but he could have stayed alive for many hours. Captain Jim Souter said, quote, There's not a member of the Fort Worth Fire Department that could not have saved Mr. Biggs's life. That is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. He talked about the emergency medical personnel called the Golden Hour. And this is the 60 or so minutes following a trauma that could make or break a victim's chance of survival. So he said, quote, Mr. Biggs's injuries were not life threatening if they were treated early on after the causation of the accident. Gregory broke his arm, his right leg in two places and nearly amputated his lower left leg, according to Dr. Raymond Swinton an emergency medicine physician university of Texas Southwest Medical Center. There was no way to assess whether doctors would have been able to save his leg if he received help, but, quote, his injuries were limited to his extremities. According to his autopsy, he suffered no internal injuries from this crash, so he just bled to death. It had to have been awful. Which is a horrifying and scary way to go. Like, if he's... He didn't have any trauma to his brain, so he knew what happened. And being stuck in, like, broken glass. In somebody's garage. Oh, God, yeah. This is, like, what nightmares are made of. Shantae testified for almost two hours. She said she deserved to be sentenced to prison, but she didn't know for how long. She said her life had been in a downward spiral for years before the accident, and she had been smoking marijuana several times a day even while working at retirement homes. Okay. So that's where that's going. Well, Defense attorney Jeff Kearney argued that she should be found guilty of failing to stop and render aid, not murder. He argued for leniency and pointed out that she had no prior convictions, and he pointed out that his client was placed in extraordinary circumstances. I don't give a flying fuck that she had no prior convi- conviction. She let somebody die in her garage. Right. It, it's not, you know, I don't want to say that um things would be different if she just hit him and he, you know, uh, right. died yeah. right away because like it, it's still awful, but it's so much worse to know that she had the time to help. Right. And chose not to. And, you know, after, even though she took drugs and was drinking, your adrenaline starts pumping when something scary happens and that shit flushes out of your system real quick. Yep. So even if she wasn't completely sober, it's, the process is starting. She knows what she did. He said, quote, please don't destroy another life. Please give her a chance to prove that she can do something good. In his closing arguments, Jeff Kearney said that the prosecution has not made a, quote, clear, convincing case for murder and claimed the state's witnesses, quote, are not very credible. He said, quote, the act has to cause the death. If failure to provide medical help caused the death, then they cannot prove murder. It was the failure to get medical help, not the act. 
So I see what you're doing there, Jeff, trying to twist things around. Um, but that's not how it works. Prosecutor Richard Alpert said, quote, she stole his life. She stole his hope of anyone else saving his life. That's murder. Yep. County Assistant District Attorney Christy Jack said, quote, she could have saved him. Doesn't that speak volumes about her character? Doesn't that speak volumes about the atrocity of this murder? She said that Shantae had, quote, the wherewithal to lie to the police. She lied about the number of drinks she had, about the pot and taking ecstasy. She said someone put something in her drink. Christy asked only for a sentence and not a fine, and she stated that you cannot buy justice in this county. Shantae Jawan Mallard pleaded guilty to tampering with evidence but pleaded not guilty to murder. The jury took 50 minutes to reach a verdict, and she was found guilty of both offenses and sentenced to 50 years in prison for murder and 10 years for tampering with evidence. Yep. <laughs> Shantae looked down and silently cried as the judge read the verdict. According to detention records obtained by People, her projected release date is March 3rd, 2052, but she is eligible for parole in 2027. During Shantae's trial, she addressed Gregory's son and explained that her mind had just been too muddled by fear and drugs to call for help, and she said, quote, I'm so sorry, Brandon. I'm so sorry for what I've caused your family, and I'm so sorry for the pain I have put my family through. I'm so sorry for the crime I've done to society. I really am very sorry. She explained that she feared that she would be arrested. What the fuck happened? <sighs> because hiding the body went better, huh? or like throwing the body out for somebody else to find and hoping that it went would, would it trace work. back? Yeah. yeah. Because that went mm -hmm. so much better. I know. She said, quote, I couldn't think to do the right thing. I have ruined the lives of other people. I have ruined my family's life. I have put people through pain. Now, I do want to tell you, um, I know this story is, like, awful, but there is actually a little bit of a good part at the end here. Okay. So, you know how I like to do that. I'm just so confused as to how... I can't, I, I get pulled over twice in one night for my license plate light being out and somebody can drive. With a whole body a whole in the windshield. body hanging out of their window. I know. Well, and, like, she's not on backcountry roads or anything. Like, I know it was a short drive home, but, yeah. like. It's crazy. How did nobody, nobody see saw a body? This? Yeah. Hanging out of a windshield. Right. I know. Wow. I yeah. Maybe everyone was drunk. I don't know. Could then maybe. Gregory's son, Brandon Biggs, spoke to the court just moments after the sentence was announced, and he said, "Quote to the Mallard family, we would like to say that we're sorry for your loss as well. To Shantae, I personally would like to say, I would accept your apology, and in return, I hope that you will accept my forgiveness and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ." During his victim impact statement, he told the Mallard family, quote, There's no winners in a case like this. Just as we all lost Greg, you all will be losing your daughter. He was asked if it took time to put aside feelings of hatred, and he said, Yes, it was a process, but it was a quick process. I knew I had to extend forgiveness immediately. Gregory was a bricklayer who was down on his luck. He had been dating a woman who had some financial problems, and he decided to loan her money to help. He was self-employed and relied on his truck for work. However, he couldn't make payments, and his truck was eventually repossessed. Without his truck, he couldn't work. So then he lost his house. He suffered from mental illness from his teenage years, and he was diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenia. It was a little frustrating because every psychiatrist told him something different, and at various times, manic depression and schizophrenia were diagnosed according to his mom. He was taking medications 
But since he lost his income, he couldn't afford the medication, and his mental health issues made it difficult for him to get another job. So it was just like this really bad cycle, which we know is really shitty here. Yep. Um, I mean, we suck at the whole mental health thing. And, I mean, how are you supposed to be able to work with, you know, when you're dealing with that kind of stuff? And, and honestly, and you the, can't medicate. The, with the mental health thing, too, is, like, so many people get different diagnoses, yes. like, from different people and different ages, and it really is, like, not good. Right. Yeah. It's a crisis. At the time of the accident, Gregory had been staying at a homeless shelter and worked as a mason. Denver Moore bunked with Gregory at the Union Gospel Mission for Homeless Men and said, quote, Within the homeless circle, he was a friendly person trying to do something to get established. He deserved a chance to live, too. His mother said that he was on the way to getting his life back on track when he died. Damn it! I know! Damn it, Megan! <sighs> He had limited interaction with his family at the time of his death, but his son Brandon Biggs says that he talked to his father two months before he died, and he said he was a caring guy. He liked for us to do things together, go see movies or go to the mall. During a memorial service that was held for Gregory, his mother Meredith, Meredith said, We are glad to have this ceremony to get some sort of closure. We wanted people to know that he was loved. Reverend Don George of Calvary Temple delivered the eulogy at Crown Hill Memorial Park, and he said, Gregory Biggs now has a home in heaven greater than any mansion in Dallas County. Aww. Isn't that cute? White carnations and purple irises lay over the freshly dug grave near a marker that read, Gregory Glenn Biggs, in loving memory, August 16th, 1964, to October 26th, 2001. Brandon Biggs had voiced sympathy for Shantae Mallard, even though she was responsible for his father's death. In response, convicted murderers that were on death row from around the country raised $10,000 for him. What? Okay. His statement drew the attention of the Roman Catholic Parish in Perrysburg, Ohio, that oversees publication of Compassion, a newsletter featuring introspective articles by death row inmates. The editor, Dennis Skillicorn, wrote, What a wonderful way to show our society an alternative to violence, a concept so often forgotten. Through advertising and other rev revenues, the contributors created a scholarship fund and had it presented at a ceremony to him. Now, obviously, the inmates were not allowed to attend the ceremony. So, <laughs> I mean, come on. Oh, man. Yeah. So the presentation was made by Janet Pop. Jeanette. Jeanette. Not Janet. Jeanette. <laughs> <laughs> the presentation oh. was made by Jeanette Pop whose 20-year-old daughter, Nancy DePriest, was murdered in Austin in 1988. Now, in her daughter's case, two men were wrongfully convicted and spent 12 years in prison before the real killer could get anybody to believe his confession. Jeanette is a member of the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, and she said she shunned revenge after her daughter was murdered. She said, I never wanted to stain her name with someone else's blood. Another presenter, Rick Halperin, a history professor at Southern Methodist University and a prominent opponent of capital punishment, praised Brandon Biggs as a humanitarian and the prisoners for their scholarship. He said, quote, they have done horrible things, most of them, but they're human beings they are not subhuman monsters worthy of extermination. Brandon said, I still want to extend my forgiveness to Shantae Mallard, and he let her know that the Mallard family is in his prayers. He said, quote, If love is what makes the world go round, compassion makes it sincere. Aww. <laughs> Isn't he incredible? Dude, yes! I was just like, oh, Brandon. What <laughs> the heck? Yeah. 
<laughs> Where did his dude even come from? Holy crap. I have no idea. He's, like, so amazing. But I just... Okay. The fact that death row inmates were so, like, into this story and everything that Brandon was saying and how he was just willing to immediately forgive Shantae... It's incredible. It, it honestly is. And the fact that they were willing to be a part of it even. Yeah. Because, I mean, obviously it was not optional. They didn't have to. No, and I have no idea if this newsletter is still around. But if it is, that sounds so cool. It does, And what actually. a great way for them to be able to still communicate things And be to involved society. in something. Yeah. Like, I, I hate how, you know, people just want to throw others away. I do, too. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Chef's kiss. Yeah. I saw that over there. Like, <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it. I just, like, made the motion. You definitely did. <laughs> oh, That's man. That's funny. I didn't even realize I did it till you said it. <laughs> oh, no. But it is. It, it's such a great way to end it. Like, instead of him being bitter and angry towards her... He was immediately willing to forgive her. And you Ugh. have, like, really covered some recently that are, like, going to stick in my brain for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. And this will definitely be one of them. Yep. So. No, it definitely will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and and for sure the, like, soap is still in there. Oh, the sure, The soap sure. situation. Both of them, <laughs> both, actually. Both soaps. Both soap <laughs> situations. <laughs> yeah. And the and the town bully that one keeps coming back in my head like constantly. I keep thinking about that. That's the one that um has actually been what people talk to me about the most. That's intriguing. I get yeah. talked to about that one a lot also. Mm -hmm. But I am totally fine with that because that one yeah like really stuck in there. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. That is the story of Gregory Biggs. Oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were going to say more after. No, that's it. Because <laughs> we got a little sidetracked at the end, so I was like, oh, maybe I should bring that back in. <laughs> yeah, you like, it just, I just. You like that transition? Well, it was, it was something. I mean. The I look on your face, you were just like. Failed you go? miserably because because I really thought you were going to say more. And then all of a sudden you went silent and I was like, oh, am I supposed to say something? Yeah. <laughs> Clearly I was. My bad. Mm. Sorry, I dropped the ball on that one. Okay. <laughs> all right. So make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, bye. bye. Tequila. Tequila.